All right, so good morning, everyone, on this July 17th Saturday morning at 9 o'clock Eastern, 8, uh, 8 o'clock Central. I know it's an early morning, but when you're talking about hemlocks and doing a demonstration in the summertime on treating hemlocks, having cooler temperatures is important, and I'll go over that um, when we talk about treating hemlocks. So my name is Jackie Broker. Um, I am the strike team coordinator for the Tennessee Division of Forestry. I have a hemlock strike team, which goes out and treats hemlocks in East Tennessee in the Cumberland Plateau, and I have a prescribed fire strike team. So I get the best of both worlds. I get to save trees and hug them and do conservation, but also use fire and get to play with fire in managing our forests. So um, I want to go over some housekeeping things first before we uh, continue on with the presentation. My first and most important thing is I'd like to thank everybody here for attending and to have passion and um, concern for the eastern hemlock in Tennessee and in the northeastern United States. So thank you guys for attending and, and being here. Also, I'd like to thank uh, the historic rugby. The, um, uh, they allowed me to come in and use this fantastic space. Um, and if you all, uh, Historic Rugby uh, was created in the 1890s for the second sons of British aristocrats. They have beautiful historic buildings, um, a wonderful history that you can take a tour around and see, uh, as well as stores and lodging. So um, thank you, Historic Rugby, for allowing this to, to happen. Um, and then let's go on into housekeeping here today. The first thing is we have in-house guests, so I have an in-house live audience. Um, we will have a question and answer session at the end of my presentation today, and then we'll go outside. Hopefully it won't be pouring down rain, and I can show you all um, firsthand how to treat hemlocks. There are about in the main lobby, so just when you come in and out, just be very wary of that door banging back and forth. Um, we have a Microsoft Teams guest today, so welcome to our Microsoft Teams guests. If you are here using Microsoft Teams, please use the chat box to ask questions. Those questions at the end that you put in your chat box um, will be fed to me through my coworker, Tim Phelps, who I also would like to thank for being here today. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Tim has set this up so that I could live stream and this also be recorded for those who have, weren't able to make it in person or on the virtual platform. Um, the live streaming guests, sadly you do not have an option to ask your questions, but that being said, my contact information will be at the end of this presentation, so I invite you to um, send me an email or call me. Also, I invite you to go to protecttnforests.org. We have a lot of information there and also um, a way to contact TDF forest health specialists um, through email and I encourage you to visit that site. And finally, we would like to know how things go for you today, what you thought about this event we're having. Um, I will have a QR code on the screen. Those are for every guest here. You can just take your phone and almost look like, and it'll pop up a link that survey. For my virtual guests, the same thing. When it pops up on your screen, you'll just aim your camera on your phone. On the left-hand side, that picture, it has a have turned not every needle has HWDA on it because sadly the health of the tree is in decline, therefore the population of HWA, they're like, wait, there's nothing here for me. I gotta go find a healthier, better tree. And then lastly, you see late infestation. There's a spittle bug on the right-hand side in the picture. Other bugs and insects come. There's no new growth at all. The, the tips of the twigs are all dead and breaking off. Most of the needles have gone. At this point, uh, you're at a risk of losing your tree. And it definitely will not look the same when you treat it and it recovers. Um, and I do, wanna, I do wanna touch what I just said there. Um, with evergreens, whenever the needle dies and falls off, no other needle grows in that space. So when, you, when, a, when a hemlock has declined to the point where some of the branches have um, very little um, to none uh, foliar, um, it, it takes the tree extra energy to grow in another space because it won't grow in that scarred tissue when the needle comes off. 
So, um, so that was about the hemlock, why we're trying to save it, about the hemlock woolly adelgid um, and what it does to the tree. And now I'd like to talk about what we, the big we, are trying to do to manage the situation. We don't want something that was um, like the American chestnut, where it was here and then it was gone, right? But we are, we are in that time now with the eastern hemlock. We are facing that situation. So this is what land managers um, are doing and what I can help you all do on private land. So integrate pest management. This is something that's come out in the past few decades. Um, and what it is, is you look at a landscape or an ecosystem and you decide the best method of action for that specific area and that specific problem. Now it's adaptive. You go into it and you have all of these things that you're trying to do. Maybe you treat with chemical, maybe you introduce biocontrol, maybe you thin out the stand to provide better growing space so the trees have a healthier environment to live in. Um, so you provide all of these combination of techniques and as the years go on and as you watch the problem and see how well you're managing it, you kind of mix things up. Oh, well, that didn't work. Let's try this. Oh, what? Hold on. Maybe a mixture of that and this. Um, so that's what in integrated pest management plan is. So I might add that pesticides are only used in this situation when it has been studied and looked at and decided okay, this is our best route of action. And when pesticides used, they are used at the minimal least um, harm and risk to the non-targets. Non-targets meaning um, other insects that, that could possibly be hurt, uh, other plants that could possibly be hurt, the, the state or national park it's in, uh, visitor health and safety. So for us here in Tennessee, we, um, and also on the Eastern Seaboard, we're looking at these different things here that I've listed on this slide for control and management of HWA. At this point, there is no such thing as eradication of HWA. No such thing as eradication. It is at a point where we need to just manage the situation. So we're doing chemical treatments, which I'll go into. Uh, we're treating with imidacloprid and dinotefiron, which are neonicotinoids. Um, and we're doing a target-based systematic treatment, at least here in TDF with the HWA strike team. Also, we're uh, assisting with biocontrol releases. And we'll get into that in a minute. But basically, we figured out that in, West, uh, in the Western United States, hemlocks and adelgids live there happily well-balanced, and, and they're, they're A-OK. -okay. Why aren't the hemlocks in the Western United States having these issues? Part of that is because of a resistance that those, that those um, tree species, so the mountain hemlock and the Western hemlock, have built up over time. But then also the natural predator of HWA in that area. And so researchers had found these insects and then decided to bring them over here on the eastern side to help us with this situation. Silviculture is the adjustment of a forest to make it adapt to a, wherever you want it to go. So if you want these trees to be healthy, I'm going to make this silviculture a plan that I have certain number of trees per acre and I cut the rest of them or I thin the rest of them or I hack and squirt the rest of them. It's just the ad adjustment of a forest um, so that you can manage a certain tree type or to grow it the way that you want to grow it. Genetics, sadly there's no uh, genetic match just like the American chestnut and the Chinese chestnut you know to get rid of that blight um, issue. Sadly there's no other hemlock that we have found in the world yet that we can genetically match up with the eastern hemlock. There is with the Carolina hemlock surprisingly it's a Chinese version of hemlock um, but there isn't anything that we have found that we can genetically match up uh, with the eastern hemlock. And then finally, once we come up with a way to manage this issue, how do we restore the hemlock stands that were once there? So those are the things that we are currently looking at in TDF. Uh, I'd like to go over the different types of chemical treatment. The one that we use the most is the one on the top there, the soil drench method. And that's where we use um, 
water soluble packets and mix it with water and or 2F, which is a liquid form of imidacloprid that we mix with water. And then we do a soil drench at the base of the tree. Another option is basil bark spray using the same formulations. Um, some people, not us, not here in the Tennessee Division of Forestry, it's not as quick as doing the um, soil uh, drench method. Um, basil bark spray is when you have the chemical and you spray it on the bark, and then the bark then uptakes it and metabolizes it into the tree. Cortex tablets are for when we have really dry um, drought conditions, and they're almost like time release. They're very expensive, so I don't suggest that you go out and buy yourself a bunch of Cortex tablets, because it also takes a lot of them uh, to treat your trees. Tree injection, this is the most uh, effective um, I would have to say, in treating trees that are really close to the water. With these other methods, you have to be at least 10 feet away of any water source. Tree injections, you just go and you just treat the tree. And there's also no limit on how much chemical you can put in one acre when you're tree injecting. All the rest of them, there's a limit in the amount of chemical you can put in the ground per acre, and that's per EPA. And then lastly, herbicidal oil. There are still some places like in Pennsylvania where they're doing herbicidal oil, and it's pretty much a guy dressed in a space suit, right, like a Tyvek suit, and he stands on the ground with this big, loud pump in the back, and he has this huge sprayer, and he's spraying the tree like up all the way to the top and down again, and so then you have all this oil going all over the place. We don't do that here in Tennessee. Like I said, we found the most effective way is the soil drench method. So the next uh, thing that I'd like to talk about in our integrated pest management plan is biocontrol. So on the screen here, you see the different uh, predators of HWA. When we, when we, the big we, meaning researchers in the United States and those who work for the USDA um, APHIS, when they talk about bringing in biocontrol, so many Un, un, uh, unhappy events happened in the past when we tried to do this before. So they've come up with new rules and regulations when bringing in biocontrol. And one of them is a six month quarantine. Um, when an insect is brought in, they're held for six months. And during those six months, they are fed everything they could possibly be fed um, to see, you know, okay, are they going to be a problem in the future? <laughs> You know, in, we want them to simply target HWA. We don't want them to target all these other things. And so they did. They brought um, all of these insects in uh, throughout, the to throughout time and uh, tested them. And they found that these insects here, so the first one is Sassy's cuminisuga. I call her uh, Sassy. So Sassy is a lady beetle, and she was the first... Um, this beetle was the first predator uh, insect that was reared here in the United States to try to manage this problem. The next one is Laracobius nigrinus. Laracobius, Laracobius nigrinus is from the western United States. So it is a, a native U.S. bug. Um, and then the next one is Laracobius osakensis, which is related to nigrinus. Osakensis is from Japan. Um, and we are currently um, working on the Leucopus silverfly. The Sassius cuminus cuniferarum, we did a little bit of work on that, we meaning the big we, um, but it didn't really thrive once we reared it in the lab and released it. So we're focusing our current efforts on the Laracobius beetles and the Leucopus beetles. Now remember how I said HWA, you know, you have one adult and it creates 10,000 HWA in one year, right? it moves so quickly compared to the tree, right? So that's the same thing with these, with these bugs. Even if we rear them and release them, one of these larries doesn't lay 200 eggs, you know? So it actually is going to take quite a bit of time for us to actually see a management of the, uh, the predator bugs and the HWA. And when I say quite some time, I cannot even tell you how much time. We've been releasing since 2010, maybe, and we still aren't managing the issue. So that's why we have an integrated pest management plan, where we're doing things to try to find the best method to manage it, not giving up on something that's working, but allowing an opportunity for something to come in and help. 
So the reason why we're doing so many different biocontrol is because Larry's, Laracobius nigrinus and Laracobius osakensis, they feed in the winter time, but only the winter time. So what about the spring when we have another generation of HWA? And that's where silverfly comes in. And just so you know, I always say this, and I have to say it now because I can't help myself, but if anybody is making a band and they want to sing a song about hemlocks, Sassy Larry and the Silverflies, that's a really great band name. So I encourage you to do that. So what we're hoping for with the biocontrol is eventually we can wean ourselves off on mostly chemical treatment. And then we have, just like out west, we have that ebb and flow of control of HWA and the predator beetle. That's what we're hoping for with this. So there is current monitoring and surveying going on. That's why we knew we had to find another predator other than the Larry's because it wasn't, it wasn't as effective with just the Larry's. Um, the Lindsay Young Beneficiary Insects Laboratory in UTK is who TDF, myself and my crew, and the people with the Tennessee Division of Forestry, that's who we work with. This is a picture I got off of Google Maps. Um, <laughs> Uh, of the laboratory, this building here houses cooler, or this building here houses coolers, where he keeps his eggs um, and rears. This is the area um, that you see on the bottom, where he moves all his beetles into a, a place where they can um, thrive. And then this place over here is just kind of the research lab. So Dr. Parkman has been releasing, I don't know, I want to say since 2010 around that time. He started with the Sassis cuminus suga, so the STs, and now he's mostly rearing the Laracobius beetles, um, and he's asking if he can start maybe, you know, helping with the silver fly. Cornell University is really doing a lot of research right now on the silver fly, so. Um, I do want to mention that Dr. Pat Parkman only releases on state and federal lands. And there's just, so I preempt a question here, there's no way to purchase the beetles from Dr. Pat Parkman because he's paid federally through um, the USD Forest Service. This is a picture of a, a very generic broad picture of where releases in Tennessee have happened. Just so you know, if there's a hemlock stand near you, more than likely it has been targeted for a predator beetle release. So here we are up in Rugby and you can see that um, there's been some releases in the picket area and then over here in the um, royal blue kind of North Cumberland TWRA area, all up and down the Cumberland Plateau. Here's uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. They do, do, do releases there. And then all the way down into Chattanooga, uh, the border. And this is just of the, our area. If I were to have zoomed out, you would have seen all across the Eastern Seaboard uh, beetle releases. So you ask yourself, wait a second, why should I treat my trees? Well, it isn't just because hemlocks are beautiful trees and I have a love for hemlocks and most pines, right, and conifers. It's not just that, but I do want to remind you of what I said earlier. You might not see it on your tree right now, but it's there. It is so there, and I can say it's there because I've been out there, and I've been treating out there and seeing the trees out there, so it's there. Um, when you visit uh, Smoky Mountain National Park and you see a beautiful hemlock tree, and you say to yourself, oh my goodness, look at that beautiful hemlock tree. Any tree you see alive in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park has been treated, okay? If you go tomorrow and you drive around Cates Cove and you go up to Abrams Falls, every tree you see alive, a hemlock tree, has been treated, okay? Otherwise it would be dead and you will see a lot of dead hemlock out there. Um, conservation efforts are ongoing throughout the whole, like I said, eastern seaboard, especially here in Tennessee. My crew, um, in one year we were able to walk up to each individual tree and treat it um, for a total of, I think one year it was 1,800 acres and 18,000 trees in one year. And that's climbing down into the middle of holes, pouring the chemical, I mean, it's a fantastic job. It was one of my favorite things to do. 
Um, it's ha once your trees become dead, it creates a hazard. So it's a hazard for your property and it's a hazard for your people on your property. Um, property values, when you have a whole thousands of acres or hundreds of acres of dead hemlock, that kind of, you know, makes it look a little bit bad there. Um, also aesthetics, I love hemlock trees. Right, it makes a beautiful place. I currently live on a property with beautiful hemlock trees that yes, I'm taking care of, right? Um, it would be sad if I didn't. And then, you know, here's this hemlock person for the state of Tennessee not taking care of her hemlock trees. Recreation, um, again, I'll mention that when you're traveling, whether it's hiking, during the, hiking down these drainages or traveling on kayaks or just enjoying the birds or the fish and fishing, um, recreation is a big thing in some of these areas. I, I really encourage you all, when you leave today's presentation and when you go somewhere in East Tennessee and Cumberland Plateau, pay attention to see if there's hemlocks there. Pay attention to your most favorite places and the most beautiful places that you love and look for hemlocks. More than likely, you're going to find the hemlocks in those areas. And then the financial burden. You know, the question that I always get is, it's so expensive to treat my hemlocks. Well, turn it around. How expensive is it to remove all of your hemlocks? Because that's where it's going to go. Remember again, infestation is imminent. Remember, once it's infested, you have four to 10 years, depending on the health of the tree and, and, and all of the nutrients and what it gets in the environment it thrives in. So now that I've gone through all of that, I'd like to quickly um, go over treatment of hemlocks and how to do it. The reason why I say quickly is because I'm hoping to give a demonstration today, but I don't want my virtual friends uh, to miss out on learning this, uh, how to treat hemlocks. So uh, the pictures that you see here are of two previous uh, Hemlock Woolly Adelgid Strike Team members. This is Lindsay Resler here on the right. She was in the 2017-2018 crew. That's at Cumberland Mountain State Park. And then you have Wolfgang Bain. Um, he was on the 2018-2019 crew. Um, and this is at Possum Creek Gorge, which is a state natural area, beautiful area. So first and foremost, any chemical you use requires personal protection equipment. We all have heard the term PPE now, right? Yeah, so make sure that you have eye protection while mixing. Sometimes these chemicals um, are powdery or splashy, so you wanna make sure you protect your eyes. Uh, long sleeves are really important because when it does splash or when you are pouring, you don't want it to get on you. Um, gloves are uh, important as well, of course. Pants and closed-toed shoes. I do want to mention, how many of you have pets, cats or dogs, right? Does anybody use the Seresta collar on their cat or dog for flea and ticks? There is a collar that you can put on your animal for eight months and it will keep fleas and ticks away. That's the same chemical we're using to treat these trees, okay? So it's safe for mammals, not safe for insects not not safe for aquatic arthropods okay so you always want to remember that i'm not saying drink it or pour it on you and bathe in it but what i'm saying is take precautions and read the label and be aware that it's not that big of a risk for humans to treat with this chemical the method um, that we use is the soil drench method and the way that we treat a tree um, and I'll go over each of these, is we identify the tree we want to treat, we measure it with a D-tape, which is a logging tape, or a Biltmore stick, and I'll show you guys these things later. We remove the duff with our feet around the base of the tree, um, and then we take away all of the flowering plants because we're very conscientious of pollinators, right? We're not broadcast spraying this, which is good, it's a very strategic, small area that we are putting this chemical in at. And um, we just want to make sure that we don't affect our pollinators more than needed. Um, it's not a rule. It's not a regulation. But it is what the Tennessee Division of Forestry does as a precautionary method. 
And then we pour the chem we mix the chemical and then we pour the chemical at the base of the tree, depending on how size the size of the tree. And then because the chemical is UV sensitive, we take our foot and we kick the duff back over where we remove the duff. And then we shake our spray can of blue or orange or red paint and we spray a dot at the base of the tree. And that's for records, right? If I have a bunch of trees and I've treated them, if I sell my property later, oh, by the way, here's my records of when I treated all of my trees. Or you walk out there and go, did I treat that tree? I don't remember if I treated that tree. Well, this is how you know, right? All right, so here's Wolf, Wolfgang. He is measuring a tree with a D tape. Um, and you can measure it with a plain and simple uh, measuring tape. You just have to divide by pi, which is 3.14, right? So if you measure it and it's 24 divided by 3.14, I can't do that math. That's what you got, OK? And then um, you could use a Biltmore stick, and I'll show you guys that later. And you can look it up on Google. But it's a stick that was made at Biltmore States by um, the founder of the US Forest Service, Gifford Pinchot, uh, to do forestry, to measure trees, heights, and everything. Really neat, handy dandy tool. Everybody's different, though, when they use it. It's not as exact as a um, D-tape, but forestry is an art, OK? It is an, a beautiful, creative art. So um, a Biltmore stick. And then remember what I said. It depends on the size of the tree on how much chemical you are going to pour at the base. And so I want to invite you guys in the back of the room. Uh, you see here on the right-hand side of your screen, this is for water-soluble packets, which is there on the left-hand side. That's what the tub of the packets look like. Um, this is how big the tree is by diameter at breast height, dBH. That's where you measure the tree. And how many ounces of the mixed fluid you pour at the base of the tree. I have laminated little tiny cards in the back for every one of you to take with you today um, to help you when you do this process. So you remove the duff. Um, main thing is that you want to make sure that this uh, chemical gets down to the feeder roots, which kind of like look like spider webs. When you kick your feet, you can hear a little bit of tearing. That's the feeder roots. That's where you want to target that chemical. This chemical sticks to organic matter, so you want to make sure to remove that organic matter. That's why we take the duff away, okay? Because if we just pour it on top of the leaves, the tree's not going to get it. Um, and it's UV sensitive, so you want to cover it back up. So this is a picture of Wolf again. Wolf is removing the duff there at the base of the tree. And here's what it, when you're done removing the duff at the base of the tree. This is actually an ideal hemlock to treat. We all know that hemlocks grow off the sides of bluffs. They they're, uh, maybe don't have a lot of soil all around it. And, and it's an art. It's an art. Better to pour the chemical in a spot where there's feeder roots than on a rock, right? Better to treat than not treat, even if it's only treating one, one little area. All right, and then here's Wolf removing American holly. American holly is a flowering plant. So is rhododendron, so is mountain laurel. Um, sadly, tulip poplars, so you're going to have to decide in that case, red maples. You're going to have to decide in that case, do I treat my tree or not treat my tree? Can I treat my tree on the opposite side of where the tulip poplar is and hope that it doesn't do anything? Um, I do want to mention that Dr. McCarty, Dr. Benton, she was the one who came up with this optimized dosage rate. She's a fantastic uh, professor at, uh, in, in Georgia, and uh, she came out with um, the dosage rate, but she's also currently doing research on the residual effects of imidacloprid in treating hemlocks. And her current research, you can look it up online, she's found that really there's, after one year, there's minuscule amounts of the chemical left in the pollen of flowering plants as well as the soil. All right, so pouring the chemical, you want to get around the tree as much as possible. Um, smaller trees, if you have a tree that's maybe, you know, four, five dBH, kind of like this size. Everybody see that? Um, you can't really pour two ounces around that. So just try your best. Just remove the duff, 
pour that two ounces. It doesn't have to be all the way around. It can be where the two ounces stops. Um, you can do that. Larger trees, if you don't really want to walk all the way around, pouring all the way around the tree the whole time, you can target specific areas on each side of the tree. You can do that. I have been treating hemlock since 2017 in many different methods because I've also done a little bit of research on my own. And treating trees like that, they have survived and they have thrived. So again, a rock in a hard place, right? If there's a rock in a hard place and there's a little spot of soil next to the tree, treat in the soil. That's my rock in a hard place for hemlocks. Awkward trees, that's my point, right? Awkward trees who really didn't realize that they couldn't grow on the side of the bluff and they did it anyway. So where do you treat? You treat where there's soil and where there's feeder roots. Even if that's on one large root that comes out, um, you can get those feeder roots on the edge there. Um, and then uh, lastly, I'd like to mention about pouring the chemical. We, do, we use Nalgene bottles and that has the measure, measurements on the side. Um, yep. We have someone here in the room who has an algae bottle with the ounces on the side. And that's how you are able to measure the ounces. And then once you're done, you cover it back up because it's UV sensitive and you also want to protect those feeder roots, right? And then you paint a dot. Uh, a lot of hemlock trees have moss on, on all sides. So you want to take the bottom of your can and scrub or scrape the tree where you're gonna paint the dot because if you just spray the moss, the dot's gonna fall off. <laughs> so remove the moss, spray your dot, and that's gonna last for a long time. And it's important to keep records. Did I treat this tree? How big was this tree five years ago? Oh my gosh, it's grown two inches. So um, always keep records. And what are the other things that you can do other than treating your trees? If you want to be more involved, um, we have a lot of people that are members of our Tennessee Hemlock Conserva Conservation Partnership who come to all of the meetings, who also come up to me later and say, Jackie, if there's anybody who needs help, give them my name and phone to help them. So you could also do that. Um, you could come to my presentations, um, even if you've seen them before, you could be there for support. Right? Just like I can point out Bob Lee here, who has been treating hemlocks for a long time. He's a great community member that I tell people to reach out to if they have questions, because he's doing it. He's a private landowner who's doing it. Um, also visit our Tennessee Hemlock Conservation ha Partnership Facebook page. This is another venue for you as a community to go and, and use that knowledge right? That virtual knowledge that you can get that might be sometimes not good, but most of the time on this page, it's good. Hey, can someone tell me how, how would you go about treating this tree? Or does anybody have information on where they're buying their chemical? Or can someone come help me and show me how to treat my tree? This, this Facebook page is what I'm hoping that becomes. And then you can volunteer. Go help one of your neighbors treat their trees. We all know if we have 300 trees and we have to walk up to each one of them, it's sometimes daunting. But if you have a group of friends with a potluck or um, a barbecue, it's, it really goes well. All right, so if you are interested, for my virtual friends and my friends here, if you are interested in signing up for the Tennessee Hemlock Conservation Partnership email list, please uh, try to take a picture of that QR code that is on your screen that will take you to a place to enter your information to put yourself on the list. For those of you who are in-house, the QR code is kind of covered on the bottom of the screen there, so just come and see me after the presentation and I'll get your name and, and email and phone number. We'll leave this on here for just another minute. Um, so at this point, I would like to welcome some questions. Um, and my virtual uh, friends, those of you who are um, on Teams, if you want to ask questions, please put them in the chat and they'll be fed to me. Um, but here in-house, um, go ahead and ask some questions. Yes? How, how big or how little? I mean, there's lots of little trees and everything else. What should you, you say or try to say? How big? And the other question is, 
if it has one and you want to get rid of it and it has the, you know it has, well, it's got desert and it's got gelatin on it, what do you do with it? Do you just take it to, or just let it, will it, they just die there? Do you burn it? What do you do with it? Great, great questions. So two questions here. The first, the first question, no, good questions. Um, the first question is how do you decide what trees to treat, correct? The second question is if I'm not treating a tree or there's a tree with a delgit on it and I don't treat it, what do I do with the tree? Is that correct? Okay. The first question, um, how do I know what trees to treat? That's your determination. That is your determination. I've, I have a private landowner who treats even trees that are, you know, not even one inch DBH, just and not even not even 12 inches high, right? Um, and you can you can decide you want to do that. Um, you can decide that you have this large tree um, that's beautiful, but it has this massive scar in it. And I don't think that tree is going to last maybe any more than 10 years. That's a hard one, right? It's a beautiful tree, but it's got that scar. Do I treat it? That's a lot of chemical that I could spend on other trees, right? Those are all hard questions. Um, and my suggestion to you is to look at your trees and decide what you want to see in five or 10 years, right? Figure out what your end goal is. And then when you hit that end goal, then go backwards from there. So if I want all of my big trees saved, then I'll concentrate first on my big trees. If I, want some of, if some of, if I lose some of my big trees, but I want to continue the hemlocks, then maybe I'll save some of my other, um, my other smaller trees as well to take those big hemlock places. Um, there is a great guide on the internet and you can Google it. It was released this year by some of my cohorts with the US Forest Service. Uh, Bud Mayfield um, with US Forest Service and Scott uh, Sal Sal Salmon um, out of Virginia Tech. Uh, it's a guide, a pest management guide for hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, and it's for private landowners and land managers. And I, I highly suggest that for your first question um, that you read into that, it's, it's really good. And I want to remind everyone, there is no right or wrong answer here. Forestry is an art form, right? And we don't have one answer to this beautiful question. So uh, be creative, be event, invent stuff. Sometimes we don't know the solution until we try it, right? So try um, or don't try. It's your decision as landowners. The second question, if I don't treat a tree or if it just has a delgit all over it, can I burn it? Can I get rid of it? Does it help? Yes and no. Um, yes, those adelgids that you might burn, you'll kill those. But think of the hundreds of thousands that are already there. Think of the birds that are flying back and forth. So if it makes you feel better, yes, go ahead and burn it. Don't remove it from your property. Um, I, I don't suggest you take it to a dump. I don't suggest that. I mean, we do have adelgid everywhere, um, but being conscientious of your fellow landowners and other hemlock stands, um, you know, we already have a large problem of trying to maintain the populations of HWA where it's at right now. So any kind of movement of that kind of material, I would not suggest. So does that answer your questions? Yes. Okay. Yes, Bob. It related to her question. Yep. Uh, we're seeing decline now that's significant. Yes. Um, at what, is there any concrete way in that artsy world you're describing to determine whether it's worth, it's going to live or not, if it's going to trick up, survive or not, in a, in a, a good old form? Uh, I've noticed that trees that, there are trees that are not, did not put out a lot of new buds, or any, or don't even seem to be putting out new buds. Therefore, are they never going to put out any more? Go to another tree? Yeah. Any so, further guidance in that direction? Yeah, so um, the uh, creative question that was asked of me was, um, how do I know it's worth it to treat a tree if I'm not seeing the, the recovery that I want to see? And that's going to be a different answer for everyone. 
right? Because I have to say that some trees I treated and it took two years, at least two years, where I thought that tree was a goner. I was like, nope, tree's not gonna make it. And then it went through two seasons and then finally it just, boom. It just started shooting out new growth. All the hemlock, all the woolly adelgid were off of it. And then it started recovery. Um, and it looks like a beautiful, healthy tree now, whereas before it didn't, right? So um, there, are t there are resources for you all as far as that's concerned. Reaching out to community members who have been treating for a long time. Hugo DeAngelis, he's one of um, our Tennessee Hemlock Conservation Partnership uh, private landowners who's been treating, I want to say since 2014. He has a lot of trees like that on his um, kind of community's properties. Um, also here in Rugby is a really good example. If we have time and it's not raining this afternoon, I can walk you around historic Rugby and show you the different trees and how they have been managed. Some that have never been treated, some that have been treated once, some that have been treated since the beginning of Hemlock Woolly Adelgid coming to Tennessee. Um, it takes time. Just like trees last 200, 300, 400 years, it takes a lot of time um, for trees to catch up. You know, When treating with imidacloprid or dinotephron, it usually takes one to three months for that tree to metabolize. Once it metabolizes in the tree, the tree has a natural trigger and creates a natural chemical called olefin. The chemical imidacloprid triggers that chemical to be created, which is olefin, and it's the olefin that causes the resistance in hemlocks for that long period of time. When we first started treating hemlocks, big we, um, it was every three years. Okay, we gotta treat it every three years, every three years. But then we found through research, Dr. McCarty again, that the olefin that was triggered by the imidacloprid was what was causing that resistance of HWA for five to eight years. So now instead of treating every three years, we, stop, we start monitoring three years in. If it looks like five years we need to treat again, we'll treat again. And how do you determine that? You determine that by infestation levels. You determine that, oh, sorry. You determine that by um, the health of the tree. Um, new growth, is there any new growth? Well, does it look like all the needles are falling off and there's no growth at all? Give your trees time. Give your trees time to recover because, I, like I said, actually at my parents' house, I treated a tree back in 2017 and it wasn't until this year that I saw recovery. So it takes some time. It takes some time. Each tree is different, just like each person's different, right? You know, you can give me some chocolate and maybe I'll go crazy, but you give somebody else chocolate and they're like, yeah, no, I don't want chocolate. Go ahead. How are you uh, educating the local nursery personnel throughout the state as well as worldwide? Great question. So um, that is a tough question. So we actually have um, our UTK extension offices are a part of what we're doing. So they get all of the information that I'm giving to you guys through the Tennessee Division of Forestry and the Department of Agriculture. So here in Tennessee, that's how we disseminate the information out to the nursery is we also the Tennessee Division of Forestry sits under the Department of Agriculture and they are made well aware of our forest health issues. So when they go and they do their nursery inspections, other people who work for the Department of Agriculture, um, they're, a they're able to be given you know, the handouts and the information. And I'm sorry, the question is, what are we doing, big we, um, for our nurseries to get this information out to them. Now, worldwide, I can't answer you. I know that at the borders, when we now continue to ship things in and out of the United States, border patrols check those um, plant, the USDA APHIS checks those plants for pests and pathogens, um, but I don't have any more information for that. I do suggest that those of you who are interested in it, please visit USDA APHIS. APHIS website, and I'm sure they'll have something on there for you. Yes, sir. Now, when you treat these uh, hemlocks with this chemical, yes. and then the plant, the tree itself, produces its own, like hormone or chemical of its own, what does that do to resist the infestation? Does that make the plant where the 
insect that doesn't harm it or where it makes it where it doesn't taste good, it doesn't want to be there, or yeah. know, does, it, does it automatically want to kill the insect? Or? Yeah, so the question is, once you treat the tree with imidacloprid and it triggers the olefin production in the hemlock, what about that olefin makes the tree resistant to HWA? And it's, it's kind of like, ew, this doesn't taste good. Yeah, and, and the only reason why I can think that way and why I creatively say that is because the trees that I've treated, gradually the HWA die. Yeah. Gradually. So you might treat your tree this year, and next year there's still some HWA on it, and the next year, well, well there's still some HWA on it. Look at the health of the tree. If it looks like the health of the tree is recovering, but yet there's still some HWA on it, that says something. There's never going to be eradication. These bugs will try it. They will try. And so you, even though you've treated your trees, oh, this tree looks really healthy. Oh my gosh, there's a bug. They are going to continue to try. So it's not eradication, it's management. And back to your question, I think they just go, ew, right? They stick their tongue in it and they're like, oh, no. So. One more question. Yes, sir. Is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a hemlock, I know you make like all kinds of teas out of different kinds of evergreens. And I've heard people say hemlock is poisonous. And I've always read, it seems like I've read that that's actually like a bush, not actually the tree itself. Would that chemical treatment affect making like a tea out of it? Yeah, and um, yes. Because the chemical, what it does is that first year when it's metabolized by the tree, it is then in the tree. Yeah. And so that's, yeah, so you probably don't want to treat your tree with chemical and then go take some of the hemlock twigs and make a nice vitamin C yeah. tea out of it, right? Um, again, if, if the bugs are going ooey, yeah. right, that kind of means that maybe it might not be the most healthiest tree to eat from. Yeah. yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and I was just curious, you know, how long it would be before you could actually do that, like once the, the chemical is gone. Yeah, five to eight years, I would so say. Five, five, eight years later. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, come to think of it, there might be research on that because, like I said, the imidacloprid is the ewy part, mm -hmm. right? That olefin is a natural chemical that the tree has that it creates. It just goes in overtime when it when that chemical hits it. Yeah. So that chemical weans its way out and then you're left with olefin. So I would think that it would be a shorter period of time, not five to eight years, because that's the olefin that's protecting it, whereas the midocloprid is probably gone in a period of time. And olefin might taste better than bug, but it might taste good in the Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, you said something about No, no. So, yeah, so the, the thing about the poplars um, is it's a flowering plant. And so Tennessee Division of Forestry, the Department of Agriculture, we care about our pollinators. So we want to try to do the least harm we can to the whole environment. So we remove the, we remove the um, flowering plants around a hemlock tree that we're treating because that chemical, imidacloprid, the soil drench method, it travels um, vertically, not really horizontally. But we do a three-foot buffer anyway. Because right now on our property, is where the hemlocks are dying, yeah. the poplars are just yep. waiting, just waiting. Yep. Every year, yep. a little taller, a little taller. Yeah. Come on, get yeah. 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 Yeah, and rhododendron. Yeah, and so my suggestion to you is treat earlier in the fall um, because that way when springtime comes around, the tree has had the time to take up the chemical and there's less residual chemical in the ground for the, when those springtime things start pulling you know, their nutrients up, there's less chemical there for them to take. We're mostly, we're mostly concerned with what happens Yep. And how far is this stuff going to travel? Yeah, and so, yeah. So the question is, is 
What happens with this chemical once we put it in the ground? So with this soil drench method, you pour it in the ground and research has shown, again, you can search Dr. McCarty. She used to be Dr. Benton. Um, she's found that the chemical in that soil drench method, it goes vertically into the ground, not horizontally. Now, if it's compact soil, horizontally. If it is sand, don't treat because it's just gonna percolate all the way through. Right? So you really need to have um, healthy kind of uh, clumpy, sa not sandy soil when you treat. And then, like I said, it doesn't, go, um, it, doesn't go, it doesn't go horizontally from the tree. It goes vertically down into the soil. So, yes? We got one question coming in online. Yep. Great job, by the way. Enjoying your presentation. Are there any grants one should look into for removal of hemlock timber slash? Yeah. So yep. Great question. So the first question is, um, if we remove hemlock trees and we have dead and down wood, is there any grant assistance for private landowners to remove that? That's the first question. The answer to that is, I am not really sure. I know that um, you know we do have uh, NRCS does have specific grants for forest management. So I would highly suggest that you um, maybe go to the NRCS website or talk to your county NRCS representative and they'll probably be able to assist you um, if there are grants to help people remove um, dead and down wood. The second question is, are, is there any financial assistance for people to treat their trees and buying the chemicals and the gear and all the equipment it takes? Sadly, I do not currently know of any financial assistance for private landowners. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, like before, um, before I started my presentation, I was talking about how, you know, that financial burden is there. Do I treat them, which costs some money, or do I let them die and then remove them, which costs some money? So another rock in a hard place. A 14-inch DBH tree, which is kind of, I don't know if you guys can see, like that big, um, and I know that because I've hugged so many trees in my life. Um, this, this size of a tree is about a dollar and a dollar and 50 cents to two dollars to treat every five years, right? So, I mean, you, you take it, that into consideration. And then, you know, as a, as a landowner, and remember the question that this um, nice lady up front asked, she said, well, how do I decide which trees to treat? And, and that's the creative side of forestry, right? That's the, that's what do I want this to look like in the future? Picture that end goal and, and set that goal. Sometimes when I go into a hemlock stand, ask Bob, Bob can tell you this for sure, I'll go, oh yeah, I'm not gonna do this in one year. Uh-uh, nope. And I, and I stretch it out because you can only put so much chemical in the ground each year. So I just stretch it out and then the next year I go back through. Oh, I love that tree. Oh, look at that tree. Oh, beautiful, right? So um, think of it in that sense. It is overwhelming when you think about the cost but you have time, four to eight years, depending on the health of the tree. You have time, and they do recover. Um, after uh, the demonstration today of how to treat a hemlock, those of you who are here, if you want to just do a short walk with me around rugby, I can point out the different trees, hemlock trees we've had here and what their management has been. And I can tell you the recovery rate or the decimation or whatever. So. Is there any other questions? One more question. One more question. How, how long have you guys been treating the trees now with the, with the chemicals? Oh, goodness. Um, here in Tennessee, I want to say that the Great Smoky Mountains started in the, so sometime around um, 2000, 2004. Um, TDF, I think we started in 2008-ish. The HWA strike team was formed around 2013, 2014 with um, the Tennessee Hemlock Conservation Partnership, which included US Forest Service, National Park Service, Nature Conservancy, uh, TWRA, TDEC, um, all of the sister agencies. Yes? Um, I was going to say, um, you mentioned in the fall doing it. Yes. So that the spring pollen, uh, the spring flowering trees, the 
to fill the dam and not disturb them. When in the fall would you suggest it? I guess it all depends on how cold it gets, how soon. Yeah. So the water. best, thank you. That's a really good question, and I didn't have this in my presentation. The best time to treat hemlocks is during the fall and winter and early spring. The reason why is in the summertime, the trees are not taking anything up from the soil. There's no transportation in the soil that's happening into the tree in the summertime. But in the wintertime, when the tree has all the growing space in the world and all the, tree, all the leaves are off the hardwood trees, the hemlocks at that point have that opportunity to take that, um, that up. Does that mean that you do not treat in the summer? No. Rock in a hard place. Oh my God, look at my tree. It's July. What do I do? That, again, your decision, creativity, art, right? Decide, do I want to treat this tree? Now, in the summertime, you risk the, you risk the tree not taking the nutrients up. In that case, you might want to think about the expensive Cortex tablets that I mentioned during drought, right? Because that's more of a time release. So you could treat then in the summertime. But the best optimum time is in the fall, the winter, and the spring. Yes? Quick follow-up and another question that comes in that's related. Yeah. Regarding the grants, one good practice for landowners Yeah, that's a great answer. Yeah. Have access to resources. Tennessee Ag Enhancement Program is one. And there are grant programs through Tennessee Ag Enhancement that allow for timber thin improvements. So yep. if clearing slash or getting rid of hemlock on a site could qualify as that, yeah. there may be some creative ways to work with that part. Yeah. That of so uh, Tim just said, uh, thank you, Tim, for reminding me about that. This t uh, Tennessee Ag Develop. Enhancement grant. Um, you can apply for that. When does that end? I think it's soon, isn't it? It's, it's soon now, but uh, work with your area forester to get it. Call, next year. Yeah, call your area forester. Each county has an area forester. For Morgan County, it's Jason O'Shell, and you can find that information on our website, um, tn.gov, in the search bar. You can type in uh, Division of Forestry Directory. And on that directory page, it'll have all of the counties listed out. You can click on the county, and it'll tell you which area forester um, is there. And so. a follow-up question on team related to this. Are there any private consultants that are available for landowners to access to do some of the treatment if the landowner is unable to do it themselves? Yes, very good question. Um, you know, there aren't that many that I know of off the top of my head. Um, I do know that Panther Creek Forestry um, has a, a great, uh, one, I know great one person um, who uh, is attending today um, who can help um, with that. And I think there are others. Um, you know, reach out to these uh, uh, consultants and these foresters, consultant foresters. They can give you also some information. And your area foresters have a list of consulting foresters in your specific area. So again, reach out to your area forester um, and they'll be able to provide you with more information. We also have a directory of consultants online. Yes, thank you, Tim. We do. You can go on, again, tn.gov in the search bar, uh, bar. Just look for directory of con forestry consultants, and that should pull something up for you. All right. Um, we don't have any more questions. So at this point, I'd like to, again, invite you to, and it's not showing up on here, but invite you to uh, do that survey for me, um, a satisfa server satisfaction survey. And yep, that's it. Uh, those of you who are still watching, please uh, take your camera and try to take a picture of the QR code and do that survey for me. Those of you who are here in the room, on the back of the room, on that, uh, uh, I don't know, baluster back there. I do have the, thank you, sir, the QR code for that survey. So please do that. And uh, thank you for attending the in-house presentation today. And those of you who are virtual, thank you so much. Um, at this point, I'm going to talk to those who want to go outside and see me demonstrate how to treat what that plan is. Um, and then we'll go from there. So thank you very much.